This episode of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast is sponsored in part by Law Enforcement Labor Services in Minnesota. Law Enforcement Labor Services, also known as LELS, is Minnesota's largest public safety labor union with over 7,000 Minnesota public safety members serving in all areas of public safety. Law enforcement, 911 dispatch centers, corrections, public safety administrative support personnel, and firefighters. Established in 1977, LELS serves over 260 different public safety agencies and over 450 locals across the state of Minnesota. With their administration, general counsel, three staff attorneys, and 14 business agents, LELS provides contract negotiations for better wages and benefits, grievance processing and representation, discipline representation, mediation and arbitration, assistance with representation for post-board hearings, and in-line-of-duty death benefits for survivor families. Find out more about Law Enforcement Labor Services at LELS.org. LELS.org. Episodes of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast may contain strong language and violent content. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sheriff Scott Rose from Minnesota, and I'm your host for today's new episode of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast. He's walking eastbound, walking eastbound. In each episode of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast, we'll share the details and the stories of how these men and women heroically lost their lives in the line of duty. Our mission is to help ensure their service and sacrifice is never forgotten. Thanks for spending some time with me today to remember and honor these fallen heroes. Set in the fictional Midwestern town of Salem, this long-running soap opera followed the lives of the Hortons, Brady, Kyriakis, Hernandez, and Demera families. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Days of Our Lives started on this year and would end up being one of the longest running scripted television programs in the world. This is MacDonald Carey, and these are the days of our lives. On this year, 17-year-old Fred DeLuca asked his family friend, Dr. Peter Buck, who was a nuclear physicist, for advice on how to pay its college tuition. With an idea to open a submarine sandwich shop and an additional investment of $1,000 from Dr. Buck, the two formed a business partnership that would ultimately change the landscape of the quick-service restaurant industry. The new restaurant was called... Subway. Subway's famous giant footlong sandwiches are made right before your eyes, the way you want them, a variety of fresh and delicious ingredients. If you're really hungry, nothing beats a Subway. The partners opened their first restaurant in Bridgeport, Connecticut in August of this year, where they would serve freshly made, customizable, and affordable sandwiches to local guests. The company would grow to over 37,000 restaurants in over 100 countries. Ball two, strike two, two out. Chillibrew on first. Dodgers leading two to nothing. It was the 65th edition of Major League Baseball's World Series, with the National League Los Angeles Dodgers battling the American League champions, Minnesota Twins. He did it. Sandy Kopax gets his 10th strikeout. His second consecutive shutout of the Twins, and the Dodgers have won the 1965 World Series. The Twins had won their first pennant in Minnesota, and the franchise's first since 1933 when the team was known as the Washington Senators. The Dodgers won their second title in three years, and their third since moving to Los Angeles back in 1958. The series ended in Game 7 at Metropolitan Stadium in Bloomington, Minnesota. The year was 1965. It's October in northern Minnesota. The fall colors peaked within the past week or two, and it's still beautiful this time of year. Seasonal campgrounds are closing down for the season, while others are gearing up for the winter season for snowmobiling and ice fishing. While it's known as the land of 10,000 lakes, Minnesota actually is home to over 14,000 lakes, with over 2.9 million acres of water just a little bit smaller than the entire state of Connecticut, over 34,000 miles of lakeshore. 6% of the state is covered with water, which is more than any other state. 
To put it in perspective, Minnesota has more miles of shoreline than Hawaii, California, and Florida combined. There are also over 6,500 natural rivers and streams in Minnesota, covering 69,200 miles. In central Minnesota, northeast of the Twin Cities metro area, is Morrison County. In 1965, Morrison County had four members of the Morrison County Sheriff's Office, headed by 45-year-old Sheriff John Stack. Sheriff Stack served as a chief petty officer in the Navy during World War II, then as a member of the Naval Air Reserve, and was actually on active duty when he campaigned for 30 days on leave and got elected as the 22nd Sheriff of Morrison County, taking over in January of 1962. He was born in 1920 to Henry and Alice Stack in Anoka County and eventually settled in Little Falls with his wife Mary and their four kids. His oldest son, Ed, followed in his footsteps, serving in the Navy after being recruited by his father. He gets assigned to the recruiting command rather than go to Key West. All of a sudden, he's got to, if he's a recruiter, he has to find recruits. So lo and behold, I find myself going to the Naval Air Reserve along with a few of my friends here. Little Falls High School. Bob was John's youngest son. Well, he, you know, he's a fairly big guy compared to my brother. I mean, my brother and I are five seven. My brother was five eight. And my dad was. Just, he always said he was five eleven and three quarters. He wouldn't call himself six foot. So, and you know, old farm boy, and he was Irish to the core, and he was a prankster. Oh, I've written those people I'd run into at the VA that knew him when he was young were telling me stories, and I was like, my dad had a dual life. He was the family man to us. And he was just, behind the scenes, he was always a jokester. But he was very strict, too. So you told the line. You you know, you, you knew what was right, you knew what was wrong, and you you didn't do, you tried not to do wrong, you know. In sheriff's offices in Minnesota, like many other states in the country, the sheriff is the number one law enforcement officer in the county and usually appoints a number two in his office. Some states refer to these men and women as undersheriffs. Now in Minnesota, they're referred to as chief deputies. Having come straight out of the military and with little experience in law enforcement, John asked the current sheriff's chief deputy, Andrew Paul Hurlitz, to stay on and be his number two. Andy was actually hired by Joe Zajac, who my dad defeated, you know, in the election. But when my dad worked with Andy for the brief time my dad was there, they became good friends. And then when my dad won the election, my dad asked Andy to stay on. So Andy had, so Andy had a lot of time in the office, whereas my dad didn't. Andrew was born in 1910 in two inlets to Robert and Martha Hurlitz. Andrew, who everyone referred to as Andy, also lived in Little Falls with his wife and their three kids. His daughter, Sharon, remembers him as being a pretty strict father. Correct. Yeah. And, um... They could never figure out why I was the way I was. I didn't listen. I was all over the place. I was just, I got in trouble at least twice a week. I could hear that big old key going in that lock and the big door opening. And I thought, oh my God, where can I hide? And up to the bedroom he'd come because that's where mom, mom sent all of her problems to my bedroom. <laughs> no, all of my problems. And he'd come up there. Oh God. And, you know, I'm sorry, but I got spanked. And I, oh, I was so afraid of him. But then there's, uh, there was one time that I don't know what I had done, but um, the punishment was a little bit more severe. And I was crying. I, I think I scream cried. <laughs> I mean, you know, it just, which, you know, I mean, we're in this big brick building and the windows are open. Maybe if it's summer, you know, the whole damn neighborhood hurt. It made, I think it made the prisoners afraid. <laughs> no, but um, he, I can remember he cried. He just, he hugged me and he said, oh, I'm doing this for your own good. I don't know how many times I've told that to my own kids, but, you know, he he knew it hurt because it's the way he was raised too. And, you know, some people will say, because I've had a lot of counseling and here and there at different times, and they're, oh, it's abuse. Yes, it was. Well, now it is, yeah. But it was never out of anger. It was never out of, you know, he stood there. I knew what was coming and I knew why. <laughs> You know, and it hurt, but I got so much more out of it, out of than the pain. I mean, it was it was the interaction of my father telling me I had to be better, otherwise things wouldn't go well. 
for me and the rest of my life. Karen was Sharon's younger sister. I remember him as having a really good sense of humor. There were times, of course, when you didn't see that because things would get serious. But when things weren't quite so serious, he had a really great sense of humor. And when he'd laugh, it was kind of a big booming laugh and it was kind of contagious. Um, And then he loved music. He could play the accordion, I guess, and the harmonica. He, uh, him and mom would go dancing. He loved to dance, play cards, go fishing. He was, he was kind of an outdoors person when he, you know, could be there, be outside. And I know one thing, he was very, very spiritual. His religion, Catholic religion was, um, he was very, very involved in that. Karen was often Andy's shadow as his little girl. He was gone a lot working. He'd come home at at lunchtime and try to catch a a nap on the couch before he'd have to go back to work. And I remember he'd come home late at night, but I'd be sitting there and and, um, waiting for him. And I know we'd rent a cabin and we'd go fishing and my dad loved to fish. And he always wanted to go alone out in the morning, but he never could sneak out of the cabin unless I was there. So he ended up having to take me with him all the time. I'm not sure how happy he was about that. But, you know, I, um, I'd sneak out and be by the boat waiting for him. Morrison County is a rural county in the central part of the state. Now, its primary industry is agriculture and tourism. It was also the childhood home of Charles Lindbergh, who made the first ever nonstop solo flight across the Atlantic from New York City to Paris back in 1927. Lindbergh took off from Roosevelt Field in Long Island, New York on May 20th, 1927. He was flying a custom-built monoplane that he named the Spirit of St. Louis. And at 7.52, the Spirit of St. Louis began to roll down the muddy runway. Would it get off the ground? or would it crash at the end of the runway? Twice its wheels left the ground, only to return. And then the plane was airborne. It was 7.54 Eastern Daylight Time, the morning of May 20th, 1927. 3,600 miles to Paris. Lindbergh landed the next day at Le Bourget Field near Paris after 33 and a half hours in the air. During his groundbreaking trip, he had traveled more than 3,600 miles. Upon his arrival, more than 100,000 people came out to see aviation history in the making, and they welcomed the pioneering aviator. You can visit the Charles Lindbergh House and Museum in Little Falls and learn about early aviation and about his life. Morrison County is also home to Fort Ripley, which takes up a large portion of the eastern part of the county. When they were kids, John's oldest son, Ed, and his buddies used to sneak in and shine shoes for money. Camp Ripley was five miles out of town on the road to Brainerd, and I used to I used to shine shoes there by sneaking in. Oh, it was quite a yeah, it was quite an adventure. There's a bridge that crosses the Mississippi from Highway 371 that takes you over to Camp Ripley. And as soon as you cross the bridge, is ra- railroad tracks that go through a gate which they keep locked. And there's a white pine forest there, so somebody'd give us a ride, and we'd get dropped off. We'd climb this granite wall, then over the cyclone fence down into the white pines, and then we work our way to the edge of the pines and look for the MPs. And, and then we'd make, our, we'd make our dash across the open space into the motor pool, and the guys in the motor pool cover for us because if the MPs spotted us. And then once we got to the motor pool, we'd cross into the tent, the tent area, and we'd go up and down the rivers and we'd make a fortune trying to shoot. It was just a lucrative, lucrative business. I think the uh, uh, 50 cents was my typical rate. And if it, if the guys from Illinois, the Illinois National Guard, were the most generous guys on the planet. They oftentimes give you a dollar. Now, this is in the late 50s, early 60s. I made one, well, there was a number of times we made close to $30 each. No, I don't look at that would convert to today, but it was a hell of a lot of money. With it being more of a rural county, law enforcement work back in the 60s was pretty laid back and simple for the most part. 
In Morrison County, Highway 10 runs through it from north to south. Now, this highway is a primary pipeline for folks heading north to their cabins for the weekend or to one of the many, many northern lakes and resorts hosting fishing all year round. Dockside and boat fishing in the summer and ice fishing in the winter months. State ATV trails and snowmobile trails also stay very busy throughout the year in Morrison County. This part of central Minnesota has been a weekend vacation destination for generations of Minnesota families. Ah, put your finger right in the middle of the state. You know, halfway between the the east and the south, or the east and the west, the north and the south, and you got us. Yeah, right in the middle. I felt safe. I mean, I never was afraid. You know, and when we lived at the jail, we took our bikes and we rode all over town. I'd go all the way down to the hospital. And I was just, you know, I was just young, six, seven years old. My sister and I, you know, dad and mom would give us some money and we'd go, I'd take my sister down to the theater and we would go, you know, and then come home. And you just never thought twice, but maybe there were some little bully kids on the, you know, and, you know, like throwing spitballs at you or something, but it was safe. And it was, I always remember it being really clean. We felt really safe in that county. I mean, nothing really bad went on. We we could walk wherever we wanted to and never be afraid of anything. But I um I liked the Mississippi River. We had Green Prairie Fish Lake. I liked Camp Ripley. It it was nice. I you had you know you had the river, you had the lakes, you had the resort areas. Like I said, as as a kid walking around and doing things, I I never had any fear. Sheriff John Stack and Chief Deputy Andy Hurlitz were literally half of the deputy staff at the sheriff's office. It's a rural county, basically. You have small towns and then the biggest city being the uh, you know, the county seat, and that's only 70 some hundred people. And the sheriff's department was made up of a sheriff and three deputies was all, and for the whole county. You see, had the administrative hours, you know, Monday through Friday, whatever, 8 to 4 or 30 or whatever it was back then. And so there was a sheriff's department department phone in the sheriff's office which was attached to the jail and also the, the resident so like the residents you had the kitchen there was a big steel door that went through the jail another steel door into the office so during the administrative hours that was that office was staffed also then in our kitchen in the residence there was two phones so the private family line and then the sheriff's office phone and a play radio there right below that phone so you had yeah so uh, during off hours and weekends then the radio would be used in the share in the residence would be used for dispatching after a call came into that phone in the residence too. So he had a sheriff's office phone right by the bed and so if it rang during the night, you know, he'd have to get to Back then Bob helped feed the inmates and even dispatch calls. When my mom and dad, you know, on the occasion, rare occasion that they would go out together, one of us kids then was assigned to answer the phone. <laughs> and if we got a call so then we get on a radio to dispatch a deputy or whoever. Well, you know, it was crazy. I'm 12, probably years old, and I'm on a two-way radio dispatching deputies to an accident out by Flensburg or something. You know. And the cars were the numbered, you know, so I think one through four was the sheriff's department. And then five started the police department. And so you just went to, you know, sheriff's residence to car three. And you know, you'd get... Uh, of the deputies or whatever. My dad was car one, <laughs> and I imagine Andy would have been car two. My more than my mom was the cook for all the inmates. Then my job was when my mom, when it came time to feed them every evening at whatever time was supper. I had to be home because my mom would cook the food and I'd set it up on the tray and I'd pass it through this. There's a pantry right off of the kitchen. And there was a big barred window there with a little slot where you could slide it. And these guys would line up, you slide them their tray of food. And we set up. So I had to help my mom feed these guys, you know, basically. <laughs> oh, it was, it was, I mean, when they talk about a family affair, it was the Stack family. Now, for most of us, especially those of us in law enforcement, the thought of kids dispatching calls is really incredible. Or... How about sheriff's kids playing board games with the inmates? When we were when we first got in there and we had these inmates, and I got to know them because I was serving them food every day and all this stuff, I would go in the evening, my dad would open it up, and I'd go in and I'd play, like, Monopoly with the inmates. Oh, that's probably between 10 and 13. And one time I was in there, and I was up on the second floor, and there was 
you had individual cells, but you had this big, at the end of the cell block, there was a big lever that they could pull and then shut all the doors at once. So I'm sitting into some cell in there playing Monopoly, and my old man, you know, he he was a jokester, and he uh, all of a sudden I hear whoom, this lever start, and whoom, the door slammed shut. And then there was another big steel door then that slammed shut up there, so they could, you know, oh, and you talk about steer a kid straight. I mean, you're trying to, you couldn't even rattle those bars, and I'm just screaming, you know, I'm scared to death. I'm locked in the jail, you know. It's like I can hear my old man out there in the hallway laughing. Oh, finally he opened it back up. I tell you, my heart must have been in my throat. I'd be, oh, God. <laughs> oh. It was Saturday, October 16th, 1965. Shortly after 6 p.m., the sheriff's office received a call to respond to the Anton Emil Olson farm, which was three and a half miles west of Sobieski on County Road 14. George Gammon, farmer and neighbor east of the Olson farm, reported that another neighboring farmer had bought a tractor and clove hauler and had been given permission to park it on Gammon's property next to Olson's property line. Gammon said the tractor had been moved and was now in a swampy area on Olson's property, and he was requesting the sheriff's assistance in getting Olson to return the property. Gammon went to yet another neighbor's farm at about 6 p.m. and called the sheriff. The night before, my dad had been out on a stakeout. He was out all night and never, no, nothing happened. So he was taking a nap, and the, we had a back living room there at the jail, at the sheriff's residence. And my mother says to me, I got to run an errand to go and get some things. Would you mind answering the phone while I'm gone? So I'm sitting there at the kitchen table. My dad's sleeping in the sheriff's office for me. And it's the farmer calling to tell the sheriff that his neighbor had taken a self-propelled piece of machinery and driven it into a swamp and buried it. So I talked to this farmer, and I said, okay, I'll get my dad, and we'll send somebody else. Okay, so I go in the back of my wife and up. And I said, Dad, you got a problem. Yeah. So he, he came, sat down at the kitchen table with me. He said, what's going on? I said, I got a call from a farmer up by Sobieski that his neighbor had taken a self-propelled piece of machinery and driven it into a swamp and buried it. And he said, what's the name of the neighbor? I said, I think he said old. My dad said, uh, Anton. Is. And he said, okay, um, called Andy Hurlitz. He was at home. So my dad called Andy and said, could you meet me here with the sheriff's residence? We have a problem. So while we're waiting for Andy to show up, my dad sat down and told me the whole story of this Anton Olson while we were waiting for Andy. And what had happened a year or two previous, he had poisoned the same neighbor's six or seven head of his cows. And here's these cows laying out in the pasture, loaded, feet in the air, seven of them, or six or seven of them. That investigation determined Olson had used arsenic to poison the neighbor's cows, and a warrant was issued for his arrest. When Olson was arrested for that warrant, he was extremely violent and combative with deputies, enough so that they had to shackle both arms and legs before bringing him into the jail. Because of that incident, John knew Olson could be violent, but he thought they'd work things through after that. So then he also said to me, he said, well, you know, I happened to see Olson in town here a while back, on the sidewalk, so I took him into the Red Bull bar that was their hangout and bought Olson a drink. County sheriff, you like to, you're, you're always looking to smooth the waters over. And he said, I got things all squared away with him. So he, in his mind, thought Olson was not a problem. Originally from New Jersey, Olson had lived on the farm there for four to five years with his wife Florence and his two sons, 17 year old Gary and 10 year old Jerry. Olson also had a 29-year-old son, Thomas, who was living in New Jersey. Back in the 60s and 70s, it was not uncommon for the sheriff to go to calls without a gun or without being armed. Times were very different back then. Those guys were politicians. They had a different approach. My dad's uh, best buddy in the Navy Reserve was a St. Paul cop by the name of Jack Voida. They were both two petty officers, and they're they're thicker than thieves these two days. So, and when my dad uh, won that sheriff's raid, of course, Void has got to give him a pistol. My dad never owned a gun. So he gives him this damn nickel-plated Colt revolver. <laughs> That's what my dad used as his furthest pistol. 
when Andy and my dad left the jail, Andy came to the door unarmed. But my dad, for whatever reason, chose to carry that gun and wear it, which I never saw him do. John and Andy first drove the squad car out to where the equipment had been parked before Olson allegedly moved it. They had the flashing red lights activated on the squad to ensure neighbors and Olson knew that they were from the sheriff's office. Then the two got back into the squad and they drove down Olson's driveway with the red lights still on. As they came closer to the farm site, the lights in the barn and the yard went dark. John and Andy walked up to the house and spoke with Mrs. Olson. They explained the allegation with the threshing rig in the swamp and told her that they were tired of having trouble with Mr. Olson. They were told he was outside somewhere, not in the house. Olson and his wife had just finished milking cows and doing chores. She had gone back into the house while he walked back out to close the gates. Olson then walked into the barn, bedded and fed the calves, and was just about to leave the barn and walk to the house when he saw the sheriff's vehicle coming up the driveway. Olson watched the officers park by the garage and exit the squad with the red lights still flashing. He then snuck up to the milk house door from inside the barn and he turned off the lights. Olson was hiding in the barn and watched the deputies before retrieving a sawed-off double-barrel shotgun and ammo that he had hidden in the straw pile. He loaded the shotgun with high brass maximum load buckshot. Olson would try and explain later that he thought the deputies were there to collect on another judgment. He thought they may be there to collect a couple thousand again like they did last time. He said he didn't know they were there for the equipment that he had moved. When he saw the tractor and thrasher on what he thought was his own property, he thought the neighbors were going to try and bail his property, so his intentions were to move the equipment and force them to come back for the tractor and explain their intentions. After loading the shotgun, Olson walked over to the milk house door, and he waited. John and Andrew, about 15 feet apart, approached the barn. Olson then stepped out of the milk house with shotgun in hand and said, Hold it! The officer stopped for a split second. Seeing Olson armed, Andrew split off to the south and he headed for cover. Olson squared off aiming at John and he pulled the trigger, striking John in the back of the head. John, who was trying to get away, was able to get one shot off, but then he went down. Olson then turned towards Andrew. As quickly as he shot John, Olson turned and shot Andrew in the back as Andrew was running for cover. Andrew went down too. Olson then unloaded his shotgun, walked over to the squad car where it was parked by the garage, and placed his shotgun in the back seat. Now remember, the squad car was still running. Keys in the ignition, lights were still on. Olson took the keys out of the ignition. He opened the trunk of the squad car, and then he got in it and drove it over to the barn where Andrew and John had been shot. Olson would later tell authorities his initial thoughts were to clean up the scene and then to run. He dragged both bodies to the rear of the squad car, and then he put Andrew's body in the trunk. Now, Andrew had been shot in the back, striking major arteries, and likely died within seconds after being shot. Olson then tried to put John in the trunk, but due to John's size, he was unable to lift him. That's when he realized John was still alive. He then explained he grabbed his shotgun out of the back seat of the squad car and then walked over to his old car parked by the tree at the house. He drove a gray and white two-door 1956 Chevy. At one point, he even pulled a rag with a string through his shotgun to try and clean it, to try and get rid of evidence. He threw his shotgun into the car and then he walked up to the porch of the house. On the porch, he took off all of his clothes except for his shorts. He'd been wearing an old brown canvas hunting jacket, an old pair of overhauls, and a blue Cambridge shirt. He then walked into the house, put his clothes on the wood stove in the kitchen, and set them on fire. He went to the bedroom, changed, came back out, and he told his wife that he'd shot the officers. Mrs. Olson would later explain that John and Andy came into their house looking for Antone and accused her of trying to hide him. At the time, she said she was working in the house after chores and her two sons were in the living room watching TV. A short time later, they heard the shots outside. 
She said that's when Gary got up, her oldest son, and said he was going to work. I mean, he left the house and he drove away. A few minutes later, Anton came in and told her that he shot the officers and that he was going to run. They argued, and according to Mrs. Olson, their 10-year-old son Jerry helped convince his dad to turn himself in. Olson then left the house. Shortly after Olson left, one of the neighbor boys walked up to the house to tell one of the boys that they would have to work the next day picking turkeys. Mrs. Olson met him outside, told him to go home, to use his parents' phone, and to call for an ambulance. She told him that her husband had shot the officers. The Olsons didn't have a working phone. When Olson left the farm, he drove down Swanville Road, through Elmdale, then towards Royalton. He continued three to four miles west of Royalton until he was at the Mississippi River Bridge. There, he got out of the car, and he tossed the shotgun into the river on the north side of the bridge. At about 8.15 p.m., Olson walked into the Little Falls Police Department and told the officer there that he'd shot a man on his farm. After the neighbor boy called the sheriff's office for help, Deputy Sheriff Dave Reck responded and was the first law enforcement on scene shortly after 8 p.m. Upon arrival, Deputy Reck found Chief Deputy Hurlitz dead, his body in the trunk of the sheriff's squad car. He found Sheriff John Stack lying on the ground behind the squad with a shotgun blast to the back of the head. Sheriff Stack was still alive at the time, but barely. Searching the area, it appeared that the two had been shot near the barn. He found Andy's hat about 30 feet from the car. Sheriff Stack's hat, glasses, service revolver, and blackjack were found on the ground about 15 feet from the car. Sheriff Stack's revolver, a 38 Colt police revolver, it was chrome-plated with a four-inch barrel. It had two spent rounds in the chambers. Sheriff Stack was rushed to St. Gabriel's Hospital for emergency treatment. From there, he was transported by ambulance to University Hospitals at 12.30 a.m. That night, after helping feed the inmates and clean up, Bob had gone to the movie theater down the street with friends. I go to the movie theater, and I can remember it was The Sound of Music was on. It wasn't my type of movie, but and then I'm sitting in the theater with my friends, you know, and I'm thinking, I, I, this is not my kind of movie. And all of a sudden, one of the, somebody in the dark comes down, and they, and they page the Hurlitz girl. And I thought, you know, I just, because I had heard, I knew the name, you know, uh, and I just kind of thought, oh, I wonder what that was about. And so watched the, I watched the end of the movie, and the sheriff's residence in the jail was like one, two, maybe two and a half, three blocks from the theater. It was also, you know, we walk home, and I get to the jail, and then on the one avenue side, there's an entryway, and I open up the door, and there was like three or four steps that went up into the kitchen level, and on the left, and then on the right, there was stair, stairs that went down the basement. So I come through that entryway door, and up those four steps is the neighbor lady, Betty Smith. And she's standing there, and I, I stopped, I can remember, I stopped dead in my tracks. I knew something wasn't right, and she's, and, well, I suppose the look on her face. And she told me, your dad and Andy have been shot. Karen Hurlitz, Andy's daughter, who was 13 years old at the time, had been roller skating with friends. Andy had dropped her off at the roller skating rink earlier in the evening and promised to pick her up later. But the last time I spoke to Dad was when he picked me up, or he took me and picked up my girlfriend. We went to go roller skating at our local roller skating rink. And um, when he dropped me off, I was always a worry wart. And I said, now, are you sure you're going to pick us up? He says, yes, I will be here. I will pick you up. And that's the last time I talked to him and the last time I saw him alive. So anyhow, my friend's father called me. I don't know how long I was there, maybe a couple hours. Um, called, said he was going to come pick me up right away. And of course, you know, I said, well, why? And he said, well, your mom needs you at home right now. So I didn't ask any more questions. He didn't offer anything and that I remember. And, and I got home and mom was crying and Robert was sitting on her lap and I went to my bedroom and stayed there and I must have fallen asleep I don't know but I woke up to screaming and I realized it was Sharon uh, she had just gotten home and was told that dad had died and she lost it she was I think yeah 17 at the time and I just turned 13 on October 12th two days before dad died 
and Robert was five, and I don't remember how long Sharon screamed, but it was a long time, and I just went under the covers and went to sleep, or I do, anyhow. I couldn't stand being around all the all the grief and sadness. I couldn't handle it. Karen's older sister, Sharon, had been out on a date with her boyfriend, Richard. Deputies and city police drove all over the city trying to find the two. Sharon would come home later, pulling into the yard filled with multiple familiar family friends' cars. She thought, because mom had been sick, that something had happened to her. Friday night was just a cruising night, you know. Richard had this nice brand new 1965 hot stuff Mustang. <laughs> but anyhow, there one of the pass-throughs in town, and I think he probably picked me up like, well, maybe 6.30 or so. I don't know what time. But we heard some ambulances, and I said, oh, my God. And heaven, I don't know how many cop cars turned to go to the west out of town. And, and boy, we just got right on it. But we must have been at the end of it, and we didn't quite see where they turned. If going out of town, we didn't know if they went straight on Highway 27 towards Long Prairie Way, which would take you up by Flensburg, or if it would be down towards Sobieski. Well, Rich is from Sobieski area, and so he said everything happens out there. So we got into Sobieski, and then we didn't know if it went towards Ellumdale or if it went towards Swanville. We're on the road that Olson's farm is on. So we went towards Ellumdale, and then after you go just a mile or two, you can go to Richard's farm. So we we didn't see anything. We I didn't want to follow it anymore. Thank God in heaven. We just kept driving went back into town and see who we could catch up with. And I can still remember, you know, how excited we were to see what happened. We did some driving, and and I don't know if he. I can't remember why an argument started, but it did. And uh, I got angry, and he got mad, and. I wanted to go home, and he said no. And and so um, at this point of our relationship, Richard and I, we were really close friends, but it wasn't anything romantic. It was like, I don't know, we just we just clicked. It was like two souls together. And but anyhow, we had a fight. Then he went and we went east of town, and we sat up on a hillside and watched the lights blink on some of the towers and talked it out and uh, turned on the radio station that we could get in Minnesota, which was the radio station out of Chicago. And uh, we listened to that and fell asleep. And I woke up at three o'clock in the morning only to remember that only days before, the weekend before my dad said, Sharon, I don't care if you and Rich sit in the backyard or what you do, but, you know, be home before, you know, by 12 o'clock, one o'clock. Okay, can you do that? Because mom worries, I worry. And it's a real nice voice, but I knew he meant it because he doesn't say anything he didn't mean. (laughs) And what happened then, is it was 3.30, 3.30, quarter to four. Oh, I was never so scared in all of my life. Driving home, we didn't see any police or anything, but we we turned onto 6th Street and our house, Stack's house at that time, which it was, but we were renting. It was lit up like, (sighs) it was cars all over the place. And oh God, I thought, oh, he's got every damn cop out in town for me. I, oh, he's going to kill Richard, and I'm never going to go out till I'm a hundred. We drove up, and and um, Richard was <laughs> Richard was <laughs> sweating bullets, and yeah, got out of the car, and I was sure because our mom had been sick for years. It, the jail really did her in it, that that working, and then I, she just just had a hard time, but. I knew she died. I just knew she died. And I got out of the car. And I remember Clayton Olson, chief of police, seeing his face. And I remember seeing Norm Nelson, who was a highway patrol. And then I remember seeing Joe Lake, who was a a highway patrol also, but good friends. We, they were neighbors of ours when we lived at the river. And then there was one other man there. His, it was my best friend's father. Lorne Trimba and I I just kept saying oh god it's mama it's mama I think it was Clayton Olson that told me he said Sharon there's been a shooting and your dad's been shot and I can't I I can still (sighs) he said your dad's been shot and he said he's gone I can still I can 
still feel my feet grinding into the ground. It's like it's like the earth pulled up through the inside of me and took all that I was and all that I would ever be and shot out the top of my head. I don't remember anything after that. Apparently I fainted or passed out or I don't know what I did. And then the next thing I remember is being in the house and seeing mom sitting in the living room under a under a pale gold light and Robert was in bed and Karen where it was in bed and, but I just remember her sitting there all alone. During his initial interview, Olson told investigators that he'd been in the barn doing chores when he came out of the milk house door and observed two officers, one to his left and one to his right. Olson said the officers told him that they were going to take him in and that he should get in their car. Olson claimed that he turned and ran back into the milk house. He said that this is when Sheriff Stack, who he described as the larger officer with the silver-colored pistol, drew his gun and shot at him. He claimed the second smaller officer, later identified as Andy, fired a shotgun towards him, but hit the officer with the pistol in the head who went down. Olson then claimed that Hurlitz knelt down to help Stack, and when he did, he said he grabbed Andy's shotgun. Andy yelled, don't, don't, and Olson said he took off running. That's when Olson claimed he fired the shotgun towards Hurlitz, striking him in the back. He also described Hurlitz's shotgun as a sawed-off 12-cage. Investigators would later take Olson back out to the farm to reenact his version of what happened. His story quickly fell apart, and he eventually gave another statement, admitting he was trying to pin the shooting of Stack on Hurlitz and ultimately explained what really happened with the shooting. Olson would later appear before Municipal Judge H.M. Braggins, where first-degree murder charges were filed against Olson in a complaint signed by Deputy Jim Karnowski. Olson waived preliminary examination and his right to an attorney. Bond was set at $100,000, and he would be held at the sheriff's office until a grand jury could convene. To give you a little better perspective of that bail amount, In 1965, $100,000 would be equivalent to just under $1 million in the 2020s. At approximately 2.35 p.m. Saturday afternoon at University Hospitals in Minneapolis, Sheriff John Stack died from his injuries. John's youngest daughter was Jeannie. She was four and a half years old when he was shot and when he died. I have a really vivid memory of when my dad went to heaven. I don't remember hearing whether it was my mom or whoever it was that told me, you know, your daddy, your daddy's in heaven now, you know, and, you know, he's with God and, you know, you don't see God, God's invisible. And I remember so, because I knew my dad had been taken down to Minneapolis to a big hospital there and I never I mean I didn't get to go to the funeral of the wake or anything they isolated me from that because I was so young but I still had a memory of the room my dad was in you went down this big hall and there was hospital rooms to the right and to the left and all the way at the end of the hallway the very end not to the right not to the left but straight ahead that's where my dad's room was and when you walked into the room you opened the door and the head of his bed was to the left the foot of his bed was to the right and then beyond the foot of the bed to the right was a wall that had a window and it was many many stories up and so i pictured god standing on the other side of the clouds above the clouds and he is brushing them like you would brush away fog he's brushing them shooing the clouds away And all these cars are going in both directions, way down below. And he waited for the right moment when nobody was looking. And he flew down from heaven and into my dad's room and picked him up, went back to the window, and again, looked down to make sure that nobody was looking. And then he flew him up to heaven. That is how I pictured my daddy going to heaven. Investigators continued to collect evidence and piece together exactly what happened. 
The sheriff's office requested scuba divers from the Anoka County Water Patrol to respond and help try and recover the shotgun. Unfortunately, in October, the water was excessively high with a swift current that made searching difficult. They searched on October 17th, the 31st, and then returned on November 7th. At approximately 3 p.m. on the 7th, they recovered a 12-gauge Springfield double-barrel shotgun, sawed off at the barrel, serial number 73738. They now had the murder weapon. While the county attorney's office was putting together their case against Olson, the county of Morrison and the city of Little Falls were mourning the loss of two of their local heroes. As with many cases like this, locals would tell you that they were stunned. Stuff like this just didn't happen in this county in northern central Minnesota. On Wednesday, October 20th, funeral services for Sheriff John Edward Stack were held at St. Mary's Church with over 1,000 people attending, including over 130 law enforcement officers. Representatives from the Minnesota State Patrol, State Game Wardens, Little Falls Police Department, Naval Reserve, and Navy personnel, and many other law enforcement agencies attended. The Navy performed a full military funeral for John. We get a call from Commander Art Solberg. He was my dad's boss when we were on active duty. And he got the word. He says, the Navy wants to do whatever they can to assist in any way possible. And we would, if you would like, we would like to get him a Navy funeral. So we sat there, you know, and I talked to him briefly, and he asked me, what am, what am I doing? I said, would you believe, Commander, I'm home and leave right now from the carrier walk. He says, really? I said, yeah, in fact, I have to be back the day after tomorrow. He says, I will take care of this. Don't you worry about getting back. There was uniform sailors as call bearers and everything. Yeah, it was not a law enforcement uh, funeral. It was a Navy funeral with all of the law enforcement in attendance, but with Navy Honor Guard, Navy Bugler, Navy uh, personnel at the cemetery. Yeah, it was a Navy funeral. Well, was one guy I remember at the funeral. He had been in and out of the jail so many times. He was just one of those... My old man helped him find a job, got him squared away. He found a woman, had a wife, and then when my dad got killed, I think he was as busted up as any family member was. He was just beside himself, bawling in tears, walking around the block trying to console himself. And it was just, it was, oh, geez. John was originally from Anoka County and was living in Little Falls with his wife Mary and four kids. Two sons, 20-year-old Ed and 13-year-old Bobby, and two daughters, 18-year-old Kathy and 5-year-old Jeannie. John was very active in the community. He was a member of the Naval Reserve, Knights of Columbus, VFW American Legion, and the Peace Officers Association. He was buried in Calvary Cemetery in Anoka following the services. Chief Deputy Andrew Hurlitz's funeral was held Monday morning at St. Mary's Catholic Church in Little Falls. Originally from Two Inlets, Minnesota, he married his wife in 1937 and would later become the Chief Deputy in Morrison County in 1955 under Sheriff Joseph Zajac, prior to serving as Chief Deputy for Sheriff John Stack. Chief Deputy Andrew Hurlitz was buried in St. Mary's Cemetery in Little Falls. Andy left behind his wife Alva and their three kids, 17-year-old Sharon, 13-year-old Karen, and 5-year-old Bobby. I just remember the lights of the altar. St. Mary's Church is a rather, it's a very open, large church, not cathedral-like. It's very almost uh, 1960s modern, you know, and uh, the altar is very, um, a lot of light-colored wood and... Um, that's what I remember seeing is I just remember looking at the cross and I don't remember songs. I, I don't remember walking in. I just remember being in the pew like I was alone. I remember hearing gunshots. I remember the guns shooting. And yeah, that's all I remember. I don't remember going there. I don't remember. I don't remember anything of, of that funeral. The sheriff's office, reeling after losing literally 50% of their deputies, now had to determine who would lead from there on. 
On Sunday, the county coroner would assume the role of sheriff pending an appointment of a successor by the county board. Deputies Dave Reck and Jim Karnowski were then to continue to serve under the coroner during the interim period. Monday, the commissioners would hold a special meeting to consider the vacancy left by Sheriff Stack's murder. The county board has the power and duty to fill the unexpired term of a sheriff. Now, in this case, Sheriff Stack had 14 more months of his term left. Appearing on behalf of the sheriff's wife, who was in Anoko with the body of her husband, was Little Falls attorney John Simonette, who stated he was appearing on her behalf and asked that she be appointed to fill out the unexpired term of her late husband, Sheriff John Stack. Judge Braggins spoke on behalf of Mrs. Stack, stating that he had discussed this with area sheriffs and this procedure was not unusual. Nine years earlier, in 1956, a Mary Christensen was appointed to fill her husband's term in Steele County, Minnesota, and she served it for two years. Before that, in 1923, Murray County Sheriff James Lowe died of a sudden heart attack at 74 years old, and in that case, six people applied for the position, including Sheriff Lowe's wife, Anna. In a three-to-one vote, she was appointed by the commissioners to succeed her husband. County Attorney Autel Phoenix recommended to the board the appointment of former Morrison County Sheriff Joseph Zajac, who had served eight years as sheriff before being defeated by Stack in 1962. The board interviewed Zajac and John Grell for the position. Grell had served as sheriff for two years before Zajac back in 1954 and 1955. Following Grell's interview, a motion was made to appoint Grell. This motion failed for lack of a second when another board member made a motion to appoint Mrs. Stack. After another commissioner seconded that motion, the vote was 2-2, a tie vote. The president of the board had the option then to break the tie, which he did not. A motion was then made to approve former Sheriff Zajac with a second. This vote also ended in a 2-2 tie with the president not voting. It was decided that they would have Mrs. Stack appear before the board in person. Tuesday, Mrs. Stack was given the opportunity to express her feelings regarding the job. Now, she stated she had worked with her husband, was interested in the job, knew a great deal about the duties of the job, and wished to be given the opportunity to fill out his term. One commissioner, Theodore Marshall, indicated he did not feel, because of the circumstances, that a woman could fulfill the obligations and duties of the office. Mrs. Stack assured the commissioners that her personal feelings had not and would not enter while taking care of Olson in the jail. She assured them that she would be able to make sure the prisoner was adequately cared for during the time he was in the Morrison County Jail. In spite of her request and her insistence that she could perform the duties of sheriff, the board would later unanimously approve the appointment of Jack Grell to fill the vacancy left by John. Andy's wife really struggled for years after the murders. You know, mom was not as resilient as Mary Agnes. You know, mom just, I, I don't know, she was just different. She, she, she didn't know how to write a check. She didn't know how to pay a bill. Dad never, she never did any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, she didn't have a home. That was the toughest thing. Olson's defense attorneys tried a mental health defense with an initial evaluation from a doctor who felt that he was not capable of going to trial. The question was whether or not Olson was in a state of mental illness to such a degree that he couldn't participate in any degree in the assistance of his attorneys in his defense. A second evaluation by the state would show him competent to stand trial. The defense requested a motion to have additional psychiatric examinations conducted. This was denied by Judge Kennedy. A change of venue was also requested twice during the proceedings and was denied by the judge. In the end, Olson would plead guilty to two counts of third-degree murder and was sentenced to 40 years on September 23, 1966 nine months after killing Sheriff John Stack and Chief Deputy Andy Hurlitz. You know, these inmates that would cycle through there, you got to know them. And there's one, he had a little more of a criminal history, and after his, whatever his last offense was, now my dad was dead, he got sent to Stillwater, same prison that Olson went to. 
And we, I, we had moved back home and life had moved on. And I'm sitting on the front stoop of our house, looking down the avenue, going towards the old ballpark fairgrounds. And I see this guy walking down the road. And he keeps walking in that avenue dead end of that our house. And he just, and he starts walking up in the yard. I'm like, who the hell is this seedy looking guy? And he gets closer and he's, oh, his eyes are all jaundiced. So he's, you know, he's, he was, and then all of a sudden I recognize him. It was this guy, this one that came through several times. And he said, I just wanted you to know, he just got out of Stillwater and he liked my dad. And he said, the, the guy, you know, that Olson is not having a good time in prison. He wanted us to know. And I, I think I was alone at home at the time, and I wasn't afraid of him. I mean, he looked like hell. He was, you know, his liver was failing. But he wanted us to know that the shooter, you know, was not having a good time in Stillwater. But, I mean, this is a career criminal type, you know. So, you know, my dad, you know, he, they were doing their time in jail, but he treated them like humans. Jeannie was the youngest child in both the Stack and Hurlitz family. At a time in her life when she should have been carefree as a young girl in school playing with friends, she was consumed by the thoughts of her dad's killer. It was really hard for me growing up without a dad. You know, being in a small town and in a Catholic school, first through eighth grade, so back in the late 60s and into the 70s, um, I honestly think I was the only child in that school, first to eighth grade, that didn't have a daddy. So that was really hard on me. And I remember as a real small child, so I was four and a half when it happened, and I think I was in like first, maybe second grade, I could not wait until I was old enough to get a driver's license because it was my absolute fantasy and dream to get in a car and drive to Stillwater and go inside and of course you know I'm picturing it like a bigger version of Morrison County Jail where I could go right up to his cell and look at him and say and ask him why did you take my daddy away from me I wanted to do that so bad and he ended up dying from cancer within a few years um, of the incident. So I remember being, as, as a very young child, upset that I was never going to get that opportunity to do that. You know, I wanted, I wanted to face him face to face, bars in between us. Um, why did you take my daddy away from me? Fifty-five years later, in 2020, Sheriff Sean Larson paid tribute to these two fallen heroes with a dedication memorial service, unveiling a monument in their honor and memory, declaring that the Stack and Hurlitz families would forever be a part of their law enforcement family in Morrison County. At this tribute was a glass display case with two revolvers, Andy's revolver and John's revolver. John's revolver had been returned to the family by John's best friend, John Voida, who John actually got the gun from in the first place. I got a call many years later here in St. Cloud, and it's Voida. He's retired from the St. Cloud Police, and he and a bunch of the guys from the Naval Air Reserve are out of the chain of lakes up by Richmond Avenue, group to do a get together. He wanted to return that revolver. So I met him at the Applebee's up by Crossroads in St. Cloud. Jack and I had lunch, and then we went in the parking lot, and he he gave me the revolver. I really didn't expect to ever see it again. And then uh, I just had, I put it away here and had it for a number of years. And then when Sean Larson came up with this memorial on the 55th anniversary, I um, called uh, Sean and said, by the way, I'd like to donate my dad's uh, revolver. And the Hurlitz family decided to do the same with Andy's revolver. These two heroes, Sheriff John Stack and his chief deputy, Andy Hurlitz, they believed in right and wrong. They believed in service before self. Both of these heroes were drawn to serve their communities, to do their little part to make it a better place for them to raise their kids and their families in. They were true heroes in this community. 
Now, some would suggest that this initial complaint, Olson taking and moving the equipment, was a routine call, a call they would simply respond to and mediate. Not a call where there was a safety threat. They'd dealt with Olson before. Chief Deputy Hurlitz wasn't even armed at the time. They, they had no idea Olson would emerge from the barn with a shotgun. They were simply responding to mediate between these two farmers. Our men and women who serve respond to calls like this every day, calls that appear to be routine. Unfortunately, as we learned that day in Morrison County, there's no such thing as a routine call. Andrew's wife, Alva, never married again. She never got over the death of Andrew. She was 47 when he was killed and 71 when she passed away in 1988. John's wife, Mary, also never got over the loss of her husband and never remarried. She was 43 when he was killed and 70 when she passed in 1993. These two heroes, John Stack and Andy Hurlitz, they, they signed up to help people, to help do their little part in keeping their community and their county a little safer for their family, for their friends, for their friends' families, for their friends' kids. A calling that, unfortunately, would end in their senseless murders. It's likely that these two heroes definitely saved the lives of others. The victims could have easily been the neighbors in dispute with Olson or his family or whoever else got in his way at the time. John Stack and Andrew Hurlitz were true heroes. That calling that Andy felt to serve, the idea of service before self, the importance of, of helping others, has been passed down to his granddaughter, Shannon. Even though she's never met her grandfather, she was greatly influenced by his memory and his service. I think the biggest impact and the way it affected us the most, or, or me the most, was, you know, as, as I said, I didn't have a, a grandpa. And so it was, it was hard for me to explain to kids at a young age that, you know, why I didn't have grandpa, because you know, saying that your grandpa was killed was, was not a cool story. So you, you grow up only kind of getting to hear the stories, and, you know, you only get to ask so many questions without kind of seeing pain brought to, to people's eyes. So you hear all these amazing stories, and, and then you also hear about that, that that final day. But I think growing up, it, it taught me that, you know, Grandpa was a guy who helped people. You know, he forgave people. He really cared for others, how he cared for his community. And I was told that Grandpa could talk to anybody about anything. If he's seen you and you needed help, you know, Grandpa Grandpa was there. So I got to see all those wonderful pictures and, and hear the stories, see him, you know, see him in a helicopter and hear about what he did and, you know, how he'd bring, you know, kids home, kids that were lost or kids that were being bad so, or kids that were doing things they shouldn't. So I got to hear about, you know, what Grandpa did. And, and that was just such a huge impact for me to visualize what law enforcement was. Even though it wasn't cool to, to want to be a cop, it was just like, but why not? You know, like, this is what my grandpa did. He was like the coolest guy. You know, he, he helped people. You know, he took care of people. And if, if he needed something, you know, like, he was there. As a young woman in her 30s, she moved to the East Coast. She'd been training dogs and working alongside law enforcement. And her business had been successful. But deep down, she always wanted to be a cop like her grandfather. But really felt the calling after the George Floyd incident in Minnesota. My entire adult life, it's what I wanted to do. You know, it was always that, that thing in the back of your mind that you said, boy, you know, I, I wish I was a cop. So when I thought life really couldn't get any harder for Americans as a whole and, and society, the George Floyd incident happened. And it felt like everything kind of just came raining down on law enforcement. Every time I turned on the TV, there was anti-law enforcement propaganda going on. Friends that I respected, friends that were some of the best officers I know to this day, you know, they would call me crying because their job was so hard. And they really, truly felt, you know, their communities didn't appreciate them or their communities even worse, you know, didn't trust them anymore. And they were good, good cops, but I saw them getting tired. I saw them stressing out and I saw them starting to leave the call. And in my mind, I'm like, you know, we've got these great people and, and they're tired now and they're leaving. They don't believe, they don't believe that people out there like me support them. And what could I do to give back? And what knowledge should I have now being an adult? You know, having decades of experience interacting with people, working with people, what could I do? And and that's when I decided that, you know, I had the patience, I had the understanding now, I had the communication skills to, to give and provide. And my grandfather did it in the middle of his life. So I decided, well, why not give it a go? You know, I, I wasn't in my 40s yet and you know, I was mid-30s and if the sheriff here was willing to take me, I was, I was going to apply and, and see if I couldn't help. Just wanted to help. Shannon followed her dreams and her grandfather's legacy, and now serves as a deputy sheriff 
in South Carolina. So right now I am a master deputy with Richland County Sheriff's Department. I am a member of our community action team known as the CAT team. I get to do everything a regular deputy does along with all crime statistics, report. I get to interact with pretty much every community event we have. I really get to be that person that helps solve a, a non-criminal issue between neighbors. I get to help solve the civil issues. I get to help solve the criminal issues. I get to educate. I get to teach. I get to try to be that liaison between the department and the community to show who we are and, and what our, our mission is. And our department is very, very big about making sure that we're very clear about we are peace officers. We are here to keep the peace. And Sheriff Watt makes it very clear that on the back of all of our vests, it says Deputy Sheriff, Peace Officer. And that is that is our mission. That is, that is our goal. Why is this important? Why is it important that we honor and continue to remember heroes like John Stack and Andy Hurlitz? First of all, the families of these heroes are left with the lifelong sacrifice of not having their beloved son husband, father, and friend. Their sacrifice never ends. It's because of this sacrifice, this eternal sacrifice taken on by these families, a huge sacrifice made for all of us. It's because of that that we need to continue to support them and always be there for them. Honoring our fallen also reinforces to the men and women currently serving that this is a noble, honorable profession, an important calling that 99% of us would never consider taking on. These men and women, like Shannon, run towards trouble when the other 99% run away. The reality is these are ordinary people willing to take extraordinary risks, and in most cases for people they don't even know. In order for us to live safely as a society, we'll always need good men and women willing to step up, willing to take on this calling. We need these heroes in our communities. Heroes like Sheriff John Stack and Chief Deputy Andrew Hurlitz. There are several pictures from both the Hurlitz family and the Stack family on our website at www.officerdownmemorialpodcast.com. Just scroll down until you see John and Andy's picture, then click on them to go to their personal pages. There are family pictures, incident pictures, and newspaper articles there on each page. On behalf of their families and their agencies, thank you for helping us remember these two heroes. Thank you for spending the time to listen, learn about, and honor the memory of this fallen hero. Make sure you take the time to thank your local law enforcement for their service and their sacrifice. And don't forget to thank their families too. They also sacrifice so much for our safety. It's up to us to help ensure the sacrifices made by these fallen heroes and by their families are never forgotten. So please share this podcast with family and friends. Until next time, this is the Officer Down Memorial Podcast. I'm Scott Rose. Thanks for listening.